called Overdrive. Which was released in theaters July 25th, 1986. And much like Christine, this is based on a story by Stephen King. Yeah, I guess old Stevie had a thing for killer sentient vehicles because this is based on his short story simply called Trucks. And not only is Maximum Overdrive based on a Stephen King story, but Stephen King himself actually directed this. And this would be the only movie where he had such a role. Now, why didn't he do it again? Well, uh, let me explain. Though Maximum Overdrive has a huge cult following nowadays, that was not always the case. When this movie first came out, it was universally panned as being dog shit. It was torn apart by critics, and even some moviegoers could not stand it. Basically, it was viewed as a slop flop. It was made on a budget of $9 million and only took in $3.5 million at the box office. The reviews were so bad, and the revenue was terrible, and Stephen King received so much scorn from this that he vowed to never direct again. And ever since then, he's done all that he can to distance himself from this movie. And that whole thing is very surprising to me, because most people you talk to nowadays absolutely love this movie. I mean, really, what's not to love? It's a very fun movie, lots of cool imagery, and the soundtrack by ACDC is pretty stellar. Though it is considered a horror movie, it plays out as more of an action movie. In fact, I dare say, with the exception of a few graphic parts, you could probably let your kids watch this. Yeah, actually, when I first saw this movie, I was only 10 years old. And how did I see it? Did I rent it from some shady video store that rented R-rated movies to children? No, I first saw it on TBS on a Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Yes, I remember it as though it were yesterday. And let me explain, because I know this sounds very bizarre. Nowadays, TBS is a major worldwide cable network known for playing reruns of The Big Bang Theory and a bunch of other stuff I'm never going to watch. So it's a major market now, but it had its humble beginnings as a regional television station in the southern United States and really wasn't picked up by cable providers until sometime in the late 80s. At that time, it was mainly known for playing the Andy Griffith show and being the flagship station for Atlanta Braves games. But they would also be known for playing movies each night of the week. And not just movies, really cool movies like the Conan movies, Red Sonja, Commando, Predator, and of course, Maximum Overdrive. And the first time I saw any of those movies I just mentioned was on TBS. I remember they even played Big Trouble in Little China one night, and that would be the first time I saw that movie. But not only that, TBS TBS used to play Looney Tunes, Tom and Jerry, and the Three Stooges every morning, which I would watch religiously before I went to school. And every Saturday night and Sunday evening, TBS would show WCW Wrestling. TBS was a very big deal when I was a kid, and it's funny to say, but TBS actually molded who I am today. And though I can't stand anything they play nowadays, TBS was a big part of my childhood. So what happened to them? Well, what happened was they started making lots of money and decided to evolve into a television station that I, I would, would never, never watch, watch again. again. And they certainly can afford not to care about that. So why exactly am I talking about TBS? Well, to me, TBS is directly tied to Maximum Overdrive. And Maximum Overdrive is indeed what we're talking about. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, it involves machines coming to life and hunting mankind because of a comet because of a, a comet? Is that right? Because of a comet? Yeah, that's the story. A comet passes over the Earth and makes all the machines become sentient and want to kill people. And I'm fine with that. I mean, you're making a movie about killer trucks and cars and toaster ovens and shit. I mean, why bog it down with a complicated story? So it's because of a comet, okay? Just go with it. Yes, even though this movie is mainly known for the killer semi-trucks, all the machines hate people. Yes, this kooky comet has made crazy killers out of everything. Ice cream trucks, hair dryers, soda machines. I mean, nobody is safe. But seemingly, the main antagonists are the killer semi-trucks, and that's really the only thing people give a shit about. They are the most prominent imagery in the film, and the film offers us a delightful intensity, as most of the movie centers around characters that are trapped in a truck stop, being menaced by circling, psychopathic, sentient semi-trucks. And there is one truck in particular that takes the cake and pretty much becomes the movie's main character. 
character. And not only that, but most certainly a memorable horror movie character. Keep in mind that this is only a truck. It's not an actor, but the movie gives it so much personality that we view it as a movie monster. That being said, let's take a closer look at this movie monster and... Let's meet our killer! It's the Happy Toys Truck, a 1981 Western Star 4800. Yes, before its on-screen debut, this little beauty hauled coal all over the Trans-Canadian Highway. It was chosen to be featured in Maximum Overdrive because of its ominous look powerful engine, and menacing sound. It was then affixed with a giant head, modeled after the famous Spider-Man villain, Green Goblin, complete with glowing red eyes. Yes, this customized and murdered out 1981 Western Star 4800 became one of the most iconic images of the film and continues to prowl the highways of our nightmares. Um... Huh. Well, that was, uh, that was neat. I mean, it was a little much, but it was neat. Soon after, Maximum Overdrive was eviscerated in theaters, and before it became a nightly movie on TBS, it was released on VHS in 1986 by Carl Lorimar Home Video. And then, ten years later, after Carl Lorimar Home Video took a dump in a roundabout way, the home video distribution rights to Maximum Overdrive were sold to Anchor Bay Entertainment, which would give us the 1996 distribution, and then, in 2001, Anchor Bay Entertainment would give us another distribution, one that is barely known. Yet yeah, this particular distribution slipped under the radar of a lot of people. And what's weird is the other two distributions are rather easy to find today, around 15 bucks, no big deal. But this one is really hard to find. And when you do find one, it goes for around 50 bucks. And that brings us to a strange part of VHS collecting. Yeah, VHS distributions that were released from 2000 to 2006 can be kind of hard to find. And the reason is simply because there wasn't a lot of them made, nor were there a lot of them bought. Because at this place in time, DVDs were on the rise. But this was a transition period because many people still had VCRs and weren't exactly ready to give up on that tried and true format. However, they were willing to embrace the so-called future. And this point of view would give rise to the famous VCR slash DVD player combo. And if you notice, Usually on these things, the DVD player is the first thing to break. But anyways, the point is, this era in time was the transition of power of home media format. So distributors knew that DVDs were going to win the war. However, they also knew that most people still had VCRs. They wanted to accommodate the customers and make money and at the same time, keep an eye on the future. Basically, they made VHS, but not many of them. So later year VHS distributions of certain movies are few and far between and the people that bought them are even fewer and farther between. Which is why, in the realm of VHS collecting, it's usually easier to find a first distribution of a movie than it is to find the last distribution. Which is bizarre because, usually, in any kind of collecting, it's the opposite. Where the newest is worth dick and the eldest is worth gold. If you don't believe me, try looking up the VHS for the film A History of Violence. It's a movie... That was really good, by the way. If you haven't seen it, check it out. But it's a movie that was the absolute last movie released on VHS. I mean, an actual, real-time, major studio distribution of a VHS. And no, not some customized, repop, post-modern VHS release. No, an actual VHS release. Yes, A History of Violence VHS is a 2006 release, which was the year that the fall of the VHS empire was finalized. So most movies that were released within the dwindling years of the VHS empire are sort of hard to find. Watch, Watch the, the full, full episode, episode here, here, as well as other, other classic, classic Captain Captain's VHS, VHS pirate ship adventures. adventures. And please hit subscribe.